New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for joining us. We ask that you will click that share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. I want to thank all of you who joined us on Sunday for our celebration of Pastor Davis' 16th year anniversary, COVID style, uh, at New Beginning Church. You are greatly appreciated, so thank you so much for joining us. Our scripture on today is coming from Psalm 42, 1 through 5. And it reads, As a deer longs for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day long people say to me, Where is your God? I remember this as I pour out my heart, how I walked with many, leading the festive procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful shouts. Why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, Tony Evans says, Sometimes it feels like God has taken a long-distance trip and not informed us when he'll return. Have you ever felt that way? When we're going through, we have to look on the other side, look in a different direction. If we look at our problems and our pain and our sufferings, they will only uh, depress us and they will bring us down. But if we look by faith, we can see ourselves on the other side of our problems, pains, and sufferings. The psalmist in verse 5 says that he has to talk to himself. He has to say, self, why are you so dejected and filled with so much turmoil? Then he urges himself, he encourages himself. In spite of the darkness, he says, put your hope in God. And that's what we have to do. We have to put our hope in God. So let me encourage us. Let's put our hope in God. Because if we put our hope in anything else, we are headed for destruction. My prayer is, Lord, help us keep our hope, our focus on you, God. Regardless of what our issues are in life and what we're going through, help us to keep our hope and focus on you. Our song this, this afternoon is, Just Want to Praise You. And that's what we want to do. We want to praise God for all he has done for us. We want to give him glory, honor, and power for the mighty things that he's done. We want to thank him, and we want to bless him. Help us sing and rejoice. Just want to praise him. I just want to praise you forever and ever. just want to thank you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing. just want to bless you forever and ever and ever for all you've done for me. Blessings and glory and honor, yeah, they all belong to you. Blessings 
in glory and honor. They all belong to you. Blessings and glory and honor. They all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing me. Just for the Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. We thank you again, Father, for being good to us. We thank you for giving us another privilege, another chance, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for your word, your will, your way. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us, Father, to have another privilege, another chance just to read your word, study your word, walk in your word, speak your word, and be delivered by your word. We ask you to bless us now in this prayer time together, this Bible study time together. Speak to us now, Lord, and bless us, Father God, to hear you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank God. Blessings and glory and honor, they all belong to you. Thank you, Jesus. For blessing me. Thank the Lord for another privilege, another Lord's day to practice what we have already been taught and preached. Let me call your attention to chapter 2 of Colossians. Chapter 2 of Colossians. Thank you, each and every one of you, for joining us here for Bible study tonight. We're looking again at chapter 2 of Colossians. We finished chapter 1. Uh, we've picked out some nuggets in chapter 1, and now we will proceed to chapter 2, and chapter 2 will give us even more nuggets. Amen? Amen? So thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you to our visitors for being a part of our study again tonight. We're in chapter 2 of Colossians, chapter 2 <clears throat> of Colossians, and tonight we look to, to cover verses 1 through 5. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 covers the first pericope in the book of Colossians chapter 2. Amen? Let's look at what, what Paul, the Apostle Paul is the speaker here. He's writing this letter to the church, the church at Colossae. He's writing this letter to the church of Colossae. But as we move through this particular pericope, we will find out that he also deals with the church at Lo Laodicea. Lo Laodicea is the church that he's also addressing in the first five verses. So we want to look at that tonight because the Apostle Paul is not present with them. He's not there with them in the flesh. Quite naturally, he would not be there in the flesh because he's writing a letter to them. Not only is he not there in the flesh, many of them he has not met. Uh, theologians believe that he had not visited the, the city of Colossae and never met the, the new converts in Colossae. He had not met the Colossians. And then tonight we find out he has not physically in, in, the, in his presence, been in the presence of those who are in Laodicea. So let's look uh, very closely at verse number one, uh, Colossians chapter two, verse number one. He begins by saying, for I want you to know what great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. For as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, re, it, it re, reinstates here that, that they have not seen him in the flesh. He has not visited with them. But he is the author who's writing. Well, God is the author. Paul is the writer. He is the one who is writing to them, giving them wisdom, giving them knowledge, and giving them understanding of the word of God. He says, I have great conflict. I want you to know that I want you to know what a great conflict. The word conflict means a struggle. 
The word conflict comes from the Greek word that gives us our competingness, our competitiveness, those who are competing in a race, those who are struggling, those who are grinding it out, those who are who are struggling in great conflict. And Paul oftentimes used this analogy of the Athens games where men would run, men would would struggle, men would give them, themselves to the struggle in order to win a bruised reef. I told you last time we met that Paul talks about this bruised reef that was given to every winner of those games. In the Athens Olympics, they were given a bruised reef. They were given twigs that were braided together, vines that were braided together with flowers sticking throughout them. And they ran with great struggle. They ran in the midst of great struggles and conflict in order to win a crown. I told you on Sunday morning that they ran to win this crown, but those of us who work for the Lord, those of us who run for the Lord, those of us who are in our struggle for the Lord, we are not running for a bruised reef. We are running to win a golden crown. We are running to win a crown that fades not away. One of these days, if we endure one of these days, if we struggle one of these days, the struggle will be over. We will trade in the cross for a crown. Hey, that's good news. That's good news. Mm -hmm. So Paul says, he used the same term, he uses the same uh, analogy that it, it's a great struggle for me. We've been introduced in previous lessons, Philippians as well as Colossians, we've been introduced to Paul the Apostle. We've been introduced to, to Paul the servant. But tonight we introduce Paul as a prayer warrior. So the apostle Paul is now being introduced in chapter 2 of Colossians as the prayer warrior. As we read, we will see. For I want you to know what a great conflict, what a great struggle I have for you and those at Laodicea. He says, not only do I love you, not only do I struggle for you, not only do I want you to know of my struggle, I want also those at the, at the church of Laodicea to know of my struggle. Mm -hmm. Those of you who are reading uh, the book of Revelation, and these are the days that a lot of people are, are reading and teaching from the book of Revelation, you will notice this word Laodicea. It's one of the seven churches in Asia Minor. That, the, that Jesus talks about and, and John writes about in the book of Revelation. He says, I want you to know, and I want the, the other church to know, that I have great struggle, meaning that he's struggling in prayer. He's a prayer warrior. He says, I have great struggle, and I have for you and those in Laodicea. And he says, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So Paul not only let them know that I'm praying for the church, the universal church, not only am I praying for the church, the body of Christ, that I have come in contact with, that I have come across, but I'm also praying, I'm also in struggle, struggle with the devil, I'm also in struggle and in prayer for those of you I have not met. And that's how we ought to pray, our, that's how our prayer life ought to be. We not only ought to pray for those who are in our families, we ought not all, only ought to pray for ourselves, our family members and our friends, we ought to pray for those we have not met. We ought to pray for those that are in the body of Christ. We ought to lift up our voices. We ought to have a struggle, a, a supplication in our prayer life for people who have not met Jesus and for every church that's open in Jesus' name. He says in verse number two, and this is my purpose of my prayer. He's saying my purpose of my prayer is, is that their hearts will be encouraged. Why are they having to be encouraged? Because during this period, heresy is all around. 
Heresy has spread it not only to Colossae, it has also spread it to Laodicea. See, the Gnostics, they preached tradition. Oh, we've always done it this way. They preached tradition. They not only preached tradition, they preached false doctrine. The Gnostics, the agnostics, preached false doctrine. And they preached heresy, that which was not of God. And finally, they preached philosophy. Have you ever seen a person, even in the, in the Christian arena, that they can philosophize about everything? They got a philosophy for everything. What is your philosophy of life? They can give it to you. It's because men would rather hear philosophy than to hear about Jesus. Mm -hmm. In the text, we find out that the Apostle Paul says in verses 1 and 2 that I'm praying for you, I'm, I have great struggle for you, I love you. He's saying not only am I praying for those who I've seen, but I'm also praying for those who I've not seen because I understand real well what you're going through. The agnostics are praying for tradition. They are, they are worshiping tradition. They are speaking tradition. They are preaching tradition. They are preaching false doctrine. They are caught up in heresy. They are caught up in philosophy. And here I am, Paul, the apostle Paul, coming to you, and I'm not preaching heresy. I am preaching Jesus the Christ. I told you on last week that you need to make sure if you are a Sunday school teacher, a Bible study teacher, a discipleship teacher, an evangelistic teacher, if you are a preacher, you need to preach Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul comes to them not just preaching any old doctrine. He's preaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ. He's preaching and teaching the person of Jesus the Christ. So he warns them. He, he tells them over and over again, I'm praying for you. I love you. In verse number two, he says to them that your hearts may be encouraged. That your hearts may be encouraged. Men and women, especially in this day, needs encouragement. Yes. The problem with the local church is too many times we tear people down. And not build them up. Paul says, I'm calling upon you. I'm telling you that I'm praying for you. I am writing to you to inform you so your hearts will be encouraged. Yes. Let me tell you, some things can go on in our lives that will cause us to be in great need of encouragement. That's right. It is the body of Christ that ought to always be encouraging toward people. You ought to be encouraging. You, you ought not, if somebody's daughter gets pregnant out of wedlock, it's not the church responsibility to beat her up, to beat the parents up, to blame the parents, or to, to push that child aside. If somebody's child gets caught up on drugs, it is not the church responsibility to do anything other than pray for them and encourage them. Yeah. If there's a divorce in the church, we ought not be the ones that, that, are, that become divorce attorneys. We ought to become spiritual counselors, encouragers. And you don't have to be a preacher to do that. We have to understand that God has called us as the great military of Jesus Christ to encourage men to inform them in love. We ought to be encouraging to people. Amen. If somebody falls bad on their luck, loses their job, it is the responsibility of the church to encourage them. Yes. We may not be able to pay their bills, but we can encourage them. We have to get to a point in our life, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that I am struggling with this thing. I am praying for you. And I am writing unto you that your hearts may be encouraged. Yes, right. Young people today need somebody to encourage them. Amen. They are making decisions that are not of God. It is our responsibility to encourage them. Mm -hmm. 
It is our responsibility when we are, we are identified with people and people, we see people sin. It's not our place to point out their sins. It is our place to encourage them. We ought to write letters. We ought to talk to them in words of encouragement. Let them know that you've done something wrong too. Let them know that you are no, you are no, no holier than they are. Mm -hmm. Let them know, man, I'm struggling too. Yes. So it is our responsibility, as the, the Apostle Paul informs us tonight, that he is writing a letter to encourage their hearts. It is our responsibility to encourage people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Look, Father, he says, being knitted together in love. Paul says... I'm calling upon you to encourage others in the faith because there are some heretics out there. Mm -hmm. There are some false prophets out there. There are some people out there that are not walking Christ-like, and I'm calling upon the church of Jesus Christ to encourage them. Yes, right. I'm calling upon the church of New Beginning to encourage them. I'm calling upon the church of Hickory Grove to encourage them. I'm calling upon the church of Holy Trinity, Holman Street, New Covenant, Victory in Jesus to be encouraging toward them. Amen. Word of grace, be encouraging toward them. And he says that their hearts will be knit together. What this knitting together means is that they, they will be in unity, be unified. It is a powerful group of people who are unified in the faith. Amen. When a family is unified, it is powerful. When a couple is unified, it is powerful. When a church is unified, it is powerful. When something goes wrong with another church, it is the responsibility of the sister church to help them become unified. Mm -hmm. You see, churches are not in competition. They should not be in competition. We are about the same militia, the same military, the same marching artists with the, under the same general, Jesus Christ. We ought to march together. Yes. We ought to struggle together. We ought to support each other. We ought to be about God's business and on one accord. If that's not us, then we are not unified. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 that we would be unified in love. Paul comes back in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 2. He said, being knitted together in love. We ought to love people. We ought to show love. And let me tell you, if you don't have love for people, they can, they can tell it. That's right. You cannot fake your love. You can't go out and buy some love. Love has to become a part of your DNA, your spiritual structure. You need to love people. We cannot, as a church, as a body of Christ, as, a, as the bride of Christ, no longer be those who act like little children on the playground, who will make fun of other children who don't have real good clothing, who will make fun of other children who are failing in school. The church is not called to make fun of people, but we are called to encourage them, Amen. to help knit them together in unity, and to show love toward them. God deliver me from a group of people who make fun of people who don't have what they have. Ironically today, the way people wear clothes is, is different from the way I grew up. Because it, when we when we got got holes in our jeans, it became embarrassing. We would take a patch, an iron-on patch, and, and rub the iron on it, and we would cover those jeans up because it had holes in it. People would laugh at you and make fun of you if you had jeans where the knees have been rubbed out and you got holes in it. Because it was an indicator that you were too broke and too poor to buy new clothing. But today, people buy clothing, they buy clothing with holes in it. Yep. 
Matter of fact, they believe that the more ripped up they, they are, the more skin that is showing, the, the cooler they are. You see, when I was growing up as a boy, if you had holes in your jeans, holes in your shoes, holes in your clothes, that was not cool. But today, the cooler the grandmama is, you can tell by the holes in her, her jeans. Because we have grandmothers, great-grandmothers today, who wear their skinny jeans with their holes in it proudly. It's your clothing. You wear what you want to wear. But my point here is things and times have changed. I'm saying to you today, regardless of what people wear, regardless of what they do, regardless of their lifestyle, it is the responsibility of the church to show love, to help knit people together in unity. It is a blessing from the Lord if you are able to encourage people so that their hearts will be knitted together in love and are in obtaining to the riches of the full assurance of understanding. We have to understand that we are here to make sure that others gain the riches of the beauty of Christ. This word riches means the wealth. This word riches means abundant. This word riches mean valuables. We want other people to have the valuables that we have, but let me stop right here and let you know these valuables, these riches, these abundances, these are not what we think they are. It's not pertaining only to money. Because if you want to find an older gentleman, you want to be an older gentleman and not an old man. The difference between an elderly gentleman and an old man is that the elderly gentleman has prepared himself well and he can make it when he gets old. Whether he prepared himself physically, emotionally, financially, he is an elderly gentleman if he's prepared himself well. If he has not prepared himself well, then he becomes an old man. Too often, we have men who have opportunities, women who have opportunities that lose that opportunity because they don't judge things well. I want to be an elderly gentleman, meaning I want to be healthy. It means I want to have wealth. It means I don't want to have to beg. I want to be an elderly gentleman. It means that I will be able to give and more than I have to receive. I say to you tonight, walk in love. Because when you get older, if you walk in love now and unify people in the body of Christ and don't look down on other people, when you get to be a seasoned saint, people will help you out. I look at my mother, my mother-in-law, and I see how people help them on every end of the globe. It's because they walked in love. Because they were unified with the body of Christ. It's because they wanted to make sure that other folk had, even when they didn't have. Whenever we came off the baseball diamond or my brothers came off the football field, I said, when we came off, all three of us came off the baseball diamond. But when my brother, I didn't say I, when he came off the base, off the football field, all the teammates came to our house. And they gathered around the stove as if they lived there. And mama would allow them, daddy would allow them to eat all they could before they went home. Many times, my brothers and I would ask the question, don't you have food at home to eat? Mom and daddy said, leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And because of that mentality, and because of that show of love, now the same people and other people are coming by the house taking care of mama, and they have taking care of mama and dad. You have to make sure that you present the full assurance of understanding, the complete 
assurance of insight. Young people these days need some insight. Old folk these days need some insight. During the election period, people need insight. Yes, they need complete understanding. Because as I look at and I hear some of the voices, even in the African-American community, that's struggling with who to vote for, Lord, give them insight. Amen. If, there are, if there are any people in the United States of America, whether you're saved or unsaved, who don't know that you ought to vote, you need insight. Yes, right. If you are of any race, if you live in these great United States of America and you have let this world beat you down until you don't know if you're going to vote or not, you need some godly insight. Amen. You need to hear from Fannie Lou Hamer. You need to hear from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. You need to hear from Reverend Jesse Jackson. You need to hear from Reverend Abernathy. You need to hear from... Uh, from Young, Andrew Young. You need to hear from those people who have shed blood and even gave, given their lives yes, right. just for you to have the right to vote. You need some insight. Yes, right. You have to exercise that right. We are at a more critical time now than we've ever been. You have to vote. You don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. And if you're confused on who to vote for, you need more insight. And if you're going to vote for a third party, you're voting for the other party. You need insight. I want to say to you today, the Bible teaches that the church, the church ought to be developing an assurance of understanding and insight. So much so, look at that verse. Verse number two, he deals with this very clearly. He, he, says, he says to us, very, very clearly that we need the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God. I told you, I told you, I told you on, on last gathering that there is a mystery and this mystery has been revealed. Pro the problem is people say that, that God works in mysterious ways and he does. But if you keep reading, it says it has been revealed, and that mystery is Jesus Christ. We have to unveil him. We have to reveal him to the world. This mystery of God, Jesus the Christ, must be unveiled. It goes on to say, verse number three, uh, verse number two, the final part of verse number two says, both of the Father and of the Son. I've told you on many occasions that there are three that makes one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. Whatever God agrees with, the Son and the Holy Spirit agrees yes. with. We have to get to a point where we are unified like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God has set an excellent example to us. And this excellent example that he has set forth to us is one that we must have love, we must be encouraging, we must be unified, we must walk and operate as one. Amen. Right there in verses 1 and 2. We need to make sure that others are able to obtain riches. And these riches are not always money. These riches are valuable, non-tangible things that God gives us. Health, strength money, wealth, good state of mind. Don't you know if you don't have a good mind, it's because God chose not to give it to you that day? Yes. The reverse is as true. If you do have a stable mind and you can actually think on your own, God has made it possible. Yes, that's right. You can't even think on your own. If God, in the blinking of an eye, if God just think that you Think that you're not, not supposed to think right now. You no longer think. Therefore, it, it warns us. It begs of us to never talk about others who can't think like we think. Yes, who can't operate mentally like we operate. Because if it had not been for God on your side, you wouldn't be able to think like you think. 
you wouldn't even be able to tie your shoes. You wouldn't even be able to pull your socks on. You wouldn't be able to roll out the bed if it had not been for God. Yes. God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, unctions us daily, deals with us on a regular basis. Yes. Some of us walk around with no oxygen tubes in our nose. We inhale and exhale every day and don't even have to think about it. Yes. It's because God has blessed us. He has given us the great riches of life. It says, verse number three, and whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In whom? In Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there exists all the treasures, all of the treasures. It's right there in the text. God has made a deposit in our lives. And these deposits are wealth. These deposits are treasures. God has presented us with great treasures. And these treasures include wisdom and knowledge. God has presented us with blow, both low wisdom, high wisdom. He has presented us with, with worldly wisdom. He's presented us with spiritual wisdom. Wisdom means how to govern oneself. Wisdom is a broad form of full intelligence. Wisdom is able to who to distinguish between matters. God has given us wisdom. Amen. God gives us wisdom. We, we can't even find it on our own. God, God gives us wisdom. And then he says, he gives us knowledge. This word knowledge is the same word we get the word science. And remember the God that we, ha we know, the God who's our God is omniscience, meaning that he is omniscient. He is omniscience. He has all knowledge. Mm -hmm. And he has given us wisdom and knowledge, meaning that he has given us science. And this science and this wisdom and knowledge that he's given us is, is so that we can understand right living. I oftentimes tell you, and this is, this is my own thing, you can quote me on it if you want to. I would rather have right living than living right. I am so glad that God is able and has given me right living instead of allowing me to live right. Because when God gives us right living, that means we live righteously. And because God gives us right living, it, we understand that it's of God and from him. But when we live right, we live right according to man's standards. When we have right living, we live according to God's standards. Living right in every household is different. But right living remains the standard for every man that's on planet Earth. When you live right, you take a group of people because of their race and you put them in a cage. When you live right, you don't mind taking children and separating them from their mom and daddy. When you're living right, because you're living according to your own standards. And when you're living right, that means that every time you open your mouth, you can tell a fear, a falsehood, or a lie and don't have a problem with it. My wife, my wife walked through the room and I was watching TV and, and he was talking, 50 minus 5 was talking, 50 minus 5 was talking. And I said, he lying. She said, how you know he lying? I said, his mouth is moving. <laughs> when you get to a point where people can dictate what you're going to say or what you're saying based on your reputation you just living right, living according to your standard, and there's nothing godly right about it. Amen. But when you have right living, 
You understand when God is right, you are wrong, that God has to stay where he is and you have to come up to where God is. When you determine in your life, in your mind to have right living, then you know that God is one who sets the standard and you live up to God's standard. Yes. And I want to be in right living because right living is godly living. So there are hidden treasures, and those treasures are treasures of wisdom, treasures of knowledge. I've said many times, and I say again tonight, our youth and young people need some wisdom. And there are three ways to get it. Number one, the number one way to get wisdom is to ask it of God. The number one way to get wisdom is to ask God to give you wisdom. The, the Bible says, if a man lacks wisdom, ask it of God. You may have all the knowledge. You may have all the intelligence. You may know a lot of book sense. But if you do not have what we call in the country, mother with, you're going to mess up some stuff. But when you have wisdom, godly wisdom, or you lack godly wisdom, you get it from God and you ask God for more. So if a man lacks wisdom, you ask it of God. The second way of getting wisdom is to read the book of Proverbs. For the book of Proverbs says that if you read Proverbs, it will give you wisdom on how to govern your life. So the second way is to read the book of Proverbs. And God has strategically laid out the book of Pro Proverbs where there's a chapter for every day of the month. 31 days in, in some months. 30 days in other months, 28 days in the month of February sometime. Let me just share with you. If you start on the first day of the month and read the book of Proverbs, one book every day, I guarantee you, you will have wisdom. One chapter every day, I guarantee you, you will have wisdom. And then for those, those months that do not have 31 days, take and double up the last two days. And when you get to the end of that month, start over reading the book of Proverbs again. Do that for one full year. And when you finish that year, start on year number two. You will have some godly wisdom. So the first, re the first way to get wisdom is to ask it of God. God, give me wisdom on how to handle myself, how to operate in these conditions. The second way to have wisdom is to read the book of Proverbs daily. Feed on it. I challenge our young people. Read the book of Proverbs every day, one chapter per day. The third way to find wisdom, to gain wisdom, to get wisdom, is to hang out with people who got wisdom. I used to sit under the oak tree on Slim Street in Illinois, Mississippi, with an 80-year-old woman, an 82-year-old woman, a 78-year-old man, and just sit there and listen. Just listen. Don't, don't talk, just listen. Hang out with people, sit with people, listen to people who have wisdom. And I believe that I'm the better for it because I did it. If I had not done it, I would have sure enough been a fool. Some of you think I'm a fool now, but that's all right. But if I had not been there, I would have been a real fool. If I had not spent time with those who had wisdom. Verse number four says, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. He says to them, when you relate back to verses one, two, and three, verse number four, he says, I say these things to you because heresy is out here. False prophets are speaking out here because they are teaching philosophy out here. Sometimes I look at people who've gone off to college and, and they've gotten their degrees and I say, Lord, have mercy. And it's simply because they think that they got just enough to be good and they got just enough to be ignorant. Mm. You got just enough philosophy to be dangerous. If you take your book sense and you ought to get your degrees, I got plenty of them, I'm gonna get another one and then I'm quitting, but you have plenty of degrees and you live by your degrees. 
If you don't put God in your degrees or put God before your degrees or put God in the middle of your degrees, you're just an educated fool. Yes. Let me just share with you. You need God in your life. Amen. Young people all over this world is making decisions without God, without wisdom. The Apostle Paul says, I'm telling you these things, walk in love. I'm telling you this to encourage you. I'm telling you this so you can have your hearts knitted together in unity. I'm telling you this so you can have the riches that God has to offer. I'm telling you this so you can understand the great mystery of God, which is Jesus the Christ. I'm telling you these things for the sake of you being a better person in life. Your degree won't make you a better person. It may make you more money. It may give you more prestige, but it will not make you a better person. Mm -hmm. Back home, the old folk used to ask children, well, what you going to school for making a decision like that? And I would say in my mind every time, school is not teaching them wisdom. We get that from sitting on the gallery with you. We got wisdom from God. We get wisdom from reading the book of Proverbs. School doesn't teach wisdom. And even some seminaries are just as ungodly as any other school. Yes. I oftentimes sit in seminary class and listen to the professor and say, is this guy really saved? Is this a Christian school? Because if you do not use godly wisdom, your degree means nothing. Yes. Your certification can be thrown out of the window. Your, your, your certification to be a police officer, we see it now every day of our lives. If you don't use godly wisdom, and if you cannot be fair in those offices, get out of them and let somebody else have them. Say to you today, walk with the Lord. He says, I'm telling you because there are men who are preaching and teaching who have persuasive words. Yeah. They are philosophers. They are heretics. They're, they're teaching false doctrine. They're teaching tradition. Paul says, but I'm coming to you teaching Jesus Christ. And today, at this junction in our lives, we need preachers, teachers, missionaries to teach Jesus Christ like never before. Amen. If we're going to get out of this situation we're in, Doctors can't get us out of it. God is going to take godly wisdom. If we're going to get out of the situation we're in tonight, the legislature can't fix it. We can't legislate this one. It's going to take God to get us out. So he says in verse number four, Colossians chapter two, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you. I don't want people to deceive you with sneaky words, with persuasive words with ungodly words. I don't want you to be deceived with these words. I don't want you to be beguiled. I don't want you to be enticed with enticing words. I don't want you to fall short because of their smooth speech, because of their language. Some people like the smoothness in some people's speech. And some people can tell you a lie and make you think it's right. They can look you dead in your eye, talk about the Lord, and be dead wrong. I'm saying to you, as Paul says in Ephesians, that we will be built up, yeah. that we will be edified. The preachers, the teachers' responsibility, the Christian responsibility is to build up other people, yes. to edify the body so that they will not be tossed to and fro with every wind and doctrine. That's why I warn you. Watch, I know this is a good time to hear several sermons a day, all week long, but be careful where you eat and what table you put your foot under. Because some people are slopping hogs and they're not feeding sheep. Mm. Finally, verse number five, Colossians chapter two, verse number five. Paul says, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to get caught up in, in persuasive words or enticing speech. Or enticing language. Verse number five says, 
For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He says, and this is the phrase that some people use all the time, I, I'm absent in the flesh, but I'm, I'm with you in spirit. And that's all right. You, you're absent in the flesh, meaning that you're not present. You're not there. But, but sometimes we ought to show up. Sometimes we just need to be there. Paul says, I haven't seen you in the flesh. I haven't seen you face to face. I'm absent in the flesh. I'm not present with you, but yet I'm with you in spirit. Paul says, I'm praying for you. Paul says, I'm praying for you. And not only am I with you in the spirit, I'm with you in such a way in the spirit until my life is geared around what's going on with you. He said, I'm with you in my mind. I'm with you in my heart. I'm contemplating what you're going through. We have to make sure that we let men, women, boys, and girls know that we with them in the spirit so much so that we're praying for them. I told you when I began this, this, this series tonight that we are, we've seen Paul as the apostle, we've seen Paul as the servant, but tonight we see Paul as the prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. We ought to be prayer warriors for folk that we don't even know. Mm -hmm. We ought to be prayer warriors for people other than ourselves and our family members. We have to get to a point where we are serious prayer warriors. Now, prayer warriors don't pray Get in the bed and shut it down. Prayer warriors are on the wall all times of day. Prayer warriors drive down the road and they see a bad accident and they begin to pray as they drive by, Lord, have mercy in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless the person involved in this accident. Touch and heal as only you can, Lord. And Lord, bless his or her family. Bless his and her family that they can cope with whatever has taken place. Yes. And Lord, if there's anybody watching, if anybody's driving by, if there's anybody affected, bless Father God that somebody be called to you, that somebody loves you enough. And if the person is still living and going to die, Lord, bless them to get to know Jesus before they die. Yes. Prayer warriors pray because they know they're in war. And when you're in warfare, you ought to bring out your best weapon, and your best weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, so we ought to pray God's Word. Mm -hmm. We ought to pray over God's Word. We ought to know God's Word, and we ought to talk to God on a regular basis. A prayer warrior knows that we ought to run to the general, and the general can beat us in prayer by ourselves. We cannot beat the enemy in prayer, but Jesus can. Mm -hmm. So we turn our prayers toward Jesus. We turn our prayers toward God. And in the midst of us telling God all about it, God is able to bless us in it. People like to throw around this word, I'm a prayer warrior, I'm a prayer warrior. But if you are a prayer warrior, you, even if you're absent in the flesh, even if you're absent in the body, you're present in the spirit, you ought to be rejoicing. Paul says he's rejoicing of their good order. Paul says he's rejoicing. He's, he's excited about it. He's thrilled about it. He's enthused about it. He has great joy about it. He's holding, he's beholding to your good order. He wants you to have, have good order. He wants you, Paul wants you to have dignity. This word order means secession. This word order means the arrangement of things. Our youth today, as well as our seniors, need a good arrangement. They need a good order of things. Paul says he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing to see your good order. He's rejoicing to see your good order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. You got to be steadfast in your faith. He wants you to be steadfast. He wants you to be able to, to be established and have confirmation and to be stable in your faith. Too many people, the least little theory comes along, they jump aboard. 
When the naming and claiming theory came out, they everybody jumped off of fundamental doctrine and jumped on naming and claiming. When prosperity preaching came out, people jumped off a fundamental doctrine and jumped on prosperity. Oh, you can have this in the morning. Folks send me texts sometime or send me inboxes sometime, and they say, if you, if you, you just, just make sure you read this, and if, if you read this and pass this on to 10 people, you're going to be a wealthy person next week. Let me tell you, young people, if you work this week, you can be wealthy next week. <laughs> If you work consistently this year for many years, you can be a wealthy elderly gentleman next year. But you cannot put your time and your trust and your faith in stuff that is fleeing and fading away. There are no get rich quick schemes that will come out successful for you, successfully for you. You got to work it out. <laughs> You got to pray it out. God has a way of making sure you are steadfast in the faith. Make yourself available to be steadfast. Don't be turned to and fro by any wind or doctrine. Paul says here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he says that I've been, I've been struggling for you. I'm in conflict for you. I'm praying for you. Paul says that even though I'm praying for those that I know, those that I've come in contact with, those who I've come in contact with and ministered to, I am also praying for those that I have not come in contact with face to face. Paul says, I'm praying in such a way and I'm asking God to give me favor that I can give you favor, that I can be encouraging to you. And he tells this church at Laodicea, as well as the church of of Colossae, that you, I am praying for you in such a way that your hearts will be encouraged. Yes. I, I'm praying for you that you all will be knitted together, Amen. meaning that you ought to have unity. Amen. I'm praying for you that you be knitted together in one love. Don't try to fake love. Give yourself to God and allow God to generate love throughout you. Amen. He said, I'm praying for you that you will understand the great mystery of God, which is Jesus the Christ. You see, the philosophers of that day were preaching tradition. They were preaching heresy, false doctrine. They, they were preaching those things that caused men to fall away. They were even preaching philosophy. Paul is saying that he's coming to preach Jesus and his righteousness. And he's preaching Jesus alone. He says that this hidden treasure of wisdom and knowledge ought to be yours. He says, lest you be deceived by the cunning words of these false prophets, these persuasive words. He says that I'm absent from the flesh. I'm absent from you in the flesh, but I'm with you in spirit. And I'm rejoicing to see the good order, the good things that are taking place. You know, when you get in touch with Jesus, he rearranges some things. Yes, he, he restructures some things. He, he puts you in, in good order that you will be steadfast in your faith, mm -hmm. not tossed to and fro by every wind or doctrine. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. Yes. Just because it makes you tickle or make you dance doesn't mean that it's of God. Stay with the Bible. Stay with the book. And if you stick with the book, the book will bless you. Thank you so much for blessing us with your presence tonight here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service. And there may be somebody here today who have not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. You can simply trust him and what he has already done on Calvary's cross. Yes, it was over 2,000 years ago that Jesus Christ died on Calvary's hill. He hung to through, he, he hung between two thieves. He died on Calvary. He died for you and he died for me. They took him off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. They sealed that tomb, but early that third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. 
That Jesus that rose from the dead says to you tonight, you can be saved right here, right here tonight. You can be born again. You can go to heaven. Because we're all going to die, but you can go to heaven when you die. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. Doesn't matter what you've done, or where you've been, or who you've done it with. Jesus says, come. I've done plenty of things that I'm not proud of, but Jesus accepted me. And you can receive him tonight by inviting him into your life as your personal Savior. Just repeat after me and ask him to come into your life. Will you bow your head with me today and, and repeat after me and ask Jesus Christ to be a part of your life. Just repeat, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And thank God. We believe that if you prayed that prayer and honestly invited Jesus Christ into your life, we believe that you're born again. And we believe that when you die, you're on your way to heaven. But you may be saved and know that you are, but for some reason or the other, you've fallen out of fellowship with God. This is your moment. You can recommit with him. You can rededicate your life to him, even on tonight. And ask Jesus of Christ to make you whole. Complete you through him. Give you a joy of rejoicing in the name of Jesus. If you need a place to serve, you need a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Where Jesus is the captain of the ship. If you would, just inbox me and let me know that you need a church home and you, you would like to make New Beginning Church your home. We will rejoice with you and be glad to celebrate with you. If you've received Jesus Christ tonight as your Savior, let us know so we can rejoice and and throw a party like they do in heaven when one soul come to Christ. We thank God for your service on tonight. And thank you for attending the service on tonight. We thank God for being a blessing to us tonight with Colossians chapter 2. Next week we'll pick up with Colossians chapter 2, verse starting at verse number 6. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 6. I'm going to ask you to, to go ahead and read all the way to verse number 10. Colossians, read the whole chapter. It's Colossians chapter 2 would be a good read for you. Colossians chapter 2, we'll be picking up at verse number 6 on next week. Now let me just share with you, it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. Thank you for taking this opportunity to worship with us, and we want you to give unto the Lord on tonight. And Invite Jesus Christ into your life as well as give unto the Lord. You can give by three forms. You can give by Cash App. Our Cash App is NBC Souls. Cash App, NBC Souls. Cash Tag, NBC Souls. Dollar Sign, NBC Souls is our Cash App. Or you can give by Zelle. Our Zelle email is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea here is as we lift Jesus, he will draw men unto himself, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. And also, you can give by P.O. Box. You can mail your gifts to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you for joining us here tonight for Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night at 720 for Bible study. Come on back and, and join us. We'll be glad to have you with us. And also you can join us on Sunday morning at uh, 9 a.m. Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school. Our brother Whitlock and brother Miles will be glad to have you in their Sunday school class. Our youth and our young people have Sunday school class by Kahoot. They have the very challenging uh, responsibility of competing with each other by answering Sunday school questions by Kahoot. So if you want to uh, 
be a part or you want your children to be a part of our youth and children Sunday school class, inbox me and let me know. And also join us on Sunday morning at 1045, Sunday morning at 1045 a.m. for our worship service. Join us at these same channels on Zoom as well as uh, on, <clears throat> on Facebook Live. Again, thank you for joining us here tonight. We want to continue to pray for the New Mount Calvary Church as they've gone through great damage. We want to pray for the New Mount Calvary Church, New Mount Calvary Church and Pastor, uh, Pastor Ronald Smith. We want to pray for that church and lift them before the Lord as they've gone through great uh, trials and still going through great trials and tribulation. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to hear your word, to study your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us tonight as we go forward in your word. Bless every listener. We ask you to touch and heal as only you can. Strengthen the bereaved, Father God. Encourage those who are, who are not encouraged. We ask you to continue to watch over us and be with us. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us all say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer.